It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson's here with great questions from you, our audience. He'll talk about uh, Apple finally updating Safari, Microsoft updating Windows, and a whole lot more. Security Now is up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 318, recorded September 14th, 2011. Your questions, Steve's answers, number 126. Security Now is brought to you by Astaro, makers of the Astaro Security Gateway. Schedule a free trial of the ASG in your business by calling 877 the number 4 ASTARO. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Security Now, the show that covers uh, protecting you and your loved ones. Online, privacy, security, and all that. And who better to do security now than my buddy right here, Mr. Steve Gibson of GRC.com, yeah. the Gibson Research Corporation. Yay! <sighs> and the crowd goes wild. <sighs> Steve is uh, the creator of uh, so many useful programs to protect you online. And now we've got 318 Security Now shows that you can study up on, which is great. Welcome, yeah. Steve. Hey, Leo. Q&A today. So we have a Q&A. Uh, not much, happily, not much news. Boy, we've been buried in security news the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, so uh, very light on the news this week, but we've got some on the long side uh, questions from listeners, but that I felt were important. So you'll be doing some reading today, Leo. And uh, but I think in all it will balance. And I have a very exciting announcement of a new science fiction author discovery to share with our listeners. So um, lots of good stuff and, and a super short spin right mention just to keep that on everybody's radar. So, have you been following? Have you been watching the Microsoft Build Conference, the new Windows 8? I guess you, of all people, probably care the least about Leo from everything <laughs> I've seen. Just shoot me now. <laughs> I mean, I, I I look over and my XP uh, my my Windows Seven that I built just to do uh, to run Skype on is now telling me that that XP has nine hundred and thirty six days remaining, and I just think good, thank God or <laughs> thank Microsoft, because the next thing I'm going to build, I'll, I'm going to update my processors to i sevens and. Um, but I'm going to use 64-bit XP. I cannot stand Windows 7. I've tried to get used to it. It's on a few machines. It just, everything, every time they do another iteration, they move it further away from something that, you know, to just makes sense. It's, and Elaine had to switch to Windows 7. Oh, my goodness. You wouldn't believe how, like, I mean, I, I could relate to everything she was saying about how she just hated it. And so I'm so glad I've got three years left of XP support. And then I look at this Windows 8, and it's like that they've just gone off the deep end. What? What? And I meant to ask you, what does Paul think about this? Well, I don't know. You know, we're going to do a whole a show about it. He's at the Build Conference, which is where they're announcing this. Uh, yeah. I downloaded it, and uh, I have it uh, installed and running on uh, in a virtual uh, machine on my uh, right. on my computer. But um, you know, I think that. Um, I think that uh, this is early version is a little buggy, this evaluation copy. So, um, <laughs> Oh, you think? We're, we're going to have a field day. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh. but, I, you know, I, I, see, you and I have, are on different kind of ends of the spectrum. I like the new thing, and you, li you hate the new thing. You, you well, I love iPads. I mean, I, for what it is, iOS is just fantastic. But the idea of, like, trying to pad eyes the desktop that I'm going to be sitting in front of and want to get serious work done with, I, I just, no. That's just wrong. I mean, I, I hated XP. They just put, you know, sugar coating on top of Windows 2000. 
But boy, what they went, what, what they did with it, with Win Seven, I just it just fights me. It's like well, okay, I, you just, probably won't like eight because I think, as far as I can tell, it's Win Seven with a tablet shell on top of it, which is probably yep. probably from your point of view the worst of all things. But I, we uh, should point out the reason that you don't like the new thing is not so much because it's the new thing in general; it's because you want something tried, true, tested, bug fixed. And well, secured, there, right? yes, there's a security aspect to it. But, for example, I run with a, an Explorer window open showing me a tree view of my system. I mean, and I can instantly jump around. I've got everything organized. I know where everything is. The moment I start using Win 7, I just immediately come to, okay, wait a minute. How do I get that? Right. And it's gone. They took it away because they said, oh, people don't want that. Well, Steve Gibson does. <laughs> But who cares what Steve? They here? didn't ask me. <laughs> oh, Steve! Thank so goodness. Good news. The good news is that XP has three years to go, and I'll be with it to the dying moment. By then, they'll have figured out Windows Seven, and you'll be set. Yeah. Maybe. You skip or Vista. Maybe. You're going to skip Vista, probably. Probably. Oh my God! <laughs> waiting, waiting was the best thing that ever happened. I could yeah. just completely yeah. jump over that nightmare. Yeah. I wish it would be kind of nice, and if they would, somebody would just kind of make a version that would be kind of like for for those of you who don't want updates, upgrades, improvements. This is the reference version of the operating system. You know, like DOS. DOS hasn't changed in twenty years. It'd be nice to have a version of Windows that just this is it. We're gonna leave it like this. If for those who want it. I guess that'll never well, happen. Well, and you could almost do that, except because, I mean, the fact is, by the time that, it's like three years from now, XP will have settled down, and they will have stopped messing with it. Well, they have stopped messing with it. And, and they will have, however, been dealing with any, you know, backfilling, any old security problems, because it'll still be under security support. And at that point... All of the new stuff will be what's under attack. It's very much like people using Windows 98, you know, second edition, 98 SE, boy. I mean, nothing infects that now because it's of a different entire DNA strain. So, so I, I, you know, it may very well be possible to just set, just stay with XP. The problem is that, that developers will be developing for Lord knows what we'll have then, Windows 26, and, you know, it won't even... <laughs> None of their software will run on XP, and that's going to be a problem. Is we, with the people who want to stay way far behind with something that just works, that gets the job done, that we won't be able to. We'll be forced forward because applications will, will, will be forcing it. Or new peripherals or whatever. I remember, for example, like remember USB was sort of forcing us forward because only the later Windows platforms uh, 10 years ago supported USB. And if you wanted to, to have peripherals that were USB, you kind of had to move forward. So, you know, it, it's inevitable, but still, some of us will just be bringing up the rear and that'll be me. <laughs> proudly, proudly Happily. bringing up the rear, Mr. Steve Absolutely. Gibson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Unabashedly, without apology, I know what's on my hard drive. <laughs> Hey, let's take I a little break, and then we'll, we're going to come back. There was a, a Patch Tuesday, a tiny little Patch Tuesday. Microsoft, I guess, is kind of busy in Anaheim. Didn't have much to patch. We'll talk about that. All the other uh, fascinating... And, we, the, and, and our line, the line between you and I, had hardly gone dead when Apple woke up. Yeah. We could talk about that last too. week. Yeah, so Apple we'll finally woke up. Yeah. Uh, details to come, but first let me tell you about Astaro. A-S-T-A-R-O dot... Com. It's a unified threat management system. We have uh, th two or three, I can't remember, ASG 300s in our wire, our, uh, our server closet downstairs. The whole, this whole enterprise now, I'm very proud to say, is protected by Astaro. And we use it, I mean, you get a lot of benefits from the Astaro security gateway. Of course, security. I mean, state, staple inspection, firewall, all the, you know, all the buzzwords, the best stuff. Three, not one, not two, but three antiviruses. One for email, uh, actually two for email, one for the uh, web. Uh, content filtering, intrusion protection. Um, but you also get a lot of side benefits. We use it for QoS because we have a number of, I think, eight VLANs, and we're doing a lot of load balancing. And the ASG is fantastic for that. Uh, if you have multiple locations, the Astaro um, uh, Command Center, ACC, is amazing. It lets you manage and control multiple gateways from a single dashboard with a, you know, you get a world map to see where your gateways are all over the world. Um, monitor 
uh, threat levels, resource usage for all the gateways. This thing is amazing. It gets better all the time. It's a combination of the best open source and commercial software to give you everything you need, including anti-spam, anti-phishing, transparent encryption, decryption, and signing on your email. You know, we haven't turned that on, but I think that would be kind of nice to turn that on. i got to talk to Russell about that. Um, you get, uh, you know, filtering, but also things like P2P control. We haven't turned that on because i got BitTorrent running right now. Um, maybe we should turn that on. <laughs> that Leo keeps killing the bandwidth. Uh, instant messaging, uh, control, all of that stuff. I'll tell you, here's the way to find out what Astaro can do for you. Call 877, the number 4, A-S-T-A-R-O, right now. 877-4-ASTARO. And arrange for a free demo in your place of business. 877-427-8277. Or visit astaro.com slash security now and take a look. If you are a non-commercial user, it's, it's completely free, including the Astaro up-to-date, which keeps you up-to-date uh, automatically. And you can run it. Uh, they have a VMware appliance. You can put it on any uh, beige box, you know, any PC. Uh, so a great home system, too, if you're, if you're kind of a do-it-yourselfer. Astaro. We're so happy to have them. They're our first advertiser ever on the Twit Network. Um, First advertiser on security now, and they're still with us like five years later. We just, we love them. ASD. And they're long haired Unix guys. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're exactly what you want. <laughs> yep. They're not guys in suits. I mean, I suppose they have some suits, but the guys who do this really know their stuff. And you know, because you saw them at the RSA conference, I know. Yeah. Astaro.com. All right, Steve. Okay, so I was pounding for several weeks on Apple not to uh, the fact that Apple had not taken the DigiNotar trust out of their um, route for Safari on the Mac and anything else that was using trusted certificates on the Mac. And it was later that day that we recorded Security Now last Thursday, because we swapped with, with, with Windows Weekly last week, that the uh, announcement was made and the update was made available is 188k so not very big and it did exactly the right thing it completely ripped all trust of digi notar out of the mac um, i wanted to see it myself to prove it to myself so i went to digi notar's site and i drilled down followed a couple links, basically pretended to want to be buying an SSL certificate. That, of course, is the last thing I wanted to be buying from those guys. I would say those clowns. Um, <laughs> but it did allow me to get to an SSL page because, of course, they were, they were trying to bring up their own security in order to give me an HTTPS connection to their server. What I found was two things. One was that the certificate itself had expired, interestingly, a few days before. Um, and, and I thought, okay, well, that's odd. But then in viewing the certificate details, there was a, ch a chain of trust back up to the certificate authority. Uh, uh, the certificate authority. And I, I forgot to say that before I applied this patch, I used Safari to do this. And I saw that that I couldn't just bring up the SSL page because the certificate was expired. But if I looked at the chain of trust, the the root CA, the DigiNotar root, was still trusted. So then I thought, okay, so that's established. Then I applied Apple's patch and did the same thing again. And sure enough, as we would hope, not only was the certificate itself expired, but when I then examined the chain of trust, the root was no longer trusted by Safari. So that, that, that's my, that was my way of verifying that Apple did the right thing. I, I tweeted the link that I found that afternoon because it was a, it's a way of allowing people to verify that their Macs and their Safaris no longer trust DigiNotar. Unfortunately, this was a little convoluted because the certificate itself was expired and you had to look at the root to see whether that was not trusted. And it's hard to convey that over 140 character 
Twitter tweet. So, um, <laughs> so some people were confused. People were trying iOS or their, you know, their iOS-based devices, their iPad or their iPhone, which have not been updated. Um, a, a good friend of mine commented that, as far as he understands, wow. iOS cannot currently be incrementally altered. That is, all the updates that we've had of iOS have been, here's your new iOS. You know, it's a, what, it's 500 meg blob that you're forced to download. That'll be one of the good things they're doing with iOS 5 is they'll finally be giving us incremental up, updates. So it may just be that iOS is not going to be changed because Apple already plans to change it shortly and they don't want to be forcing another half a gig download just to remove a single certificate from the iOS store. So I, 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 had, I didn't even think yet to try my iPad, but I haven't seen any updates that would have changed iOS. So as far as I know, it still trusts DigiNotar stuff. Uh, the good news is Mac and Safari don't after last Thursday's small 188K update. And there has been confirmation from Global Sign that they were breached. We'll remember that the hacker known as Komodo Hacker, whose lengthy paste bin uh, online post uh, I read to our listeners last week, he was claiming to have be to be in four other uh, major certificate authorities, and he named Global Sign as one. Upon hearing themselves named, they suspended certificate issuance and hired the same people that um, DigiNotar hired. Uh, however, Global Sign has been a model of of proper behavior for for this sort of problem. Well, failing the fact that they were apparently breached, they um, they've confirmed that one of their web servers, the web server that hosts its website, was breached, and they said, "quote As an additional precaution." We continue to monitor all activity to all services closely. The investigation and high threat approach to returning services to normal continues. All forensics being shared with the authorities and other CAs to assist with their investigations into other potentially related attacks. Global Sign said that system components, in quotes, were taken offline but started to come back online with the help of Cyber Defense Institute Japan on Monday. So th they haven't said, which means, because I think they are acting responsibly, they do not know of or suspect that any, any certificates were issued behind their back. It looks like some sort of web server breach did occur, um, and they're sharing details with, anyone, with, any, with other CAs who, to help them you know, spot the same sort of problem. But it doesn't look like we have a problem with Global Sign, certainly not like we had with DigiNotar, but not even like we had with Komodo before. Remember, Komodo had, had nine certs issued um, without their knowledge due to that hack, and then the, the serial numbers of those certs were then blacklisted by the various browsers quickly. But, you know, Komo it was felt that Komodo did the right thing and, and in notifying everybody quickly. So... Um, two things in our miscellany category. Um, I spent about an hour Monday morning being interviewed by KABC TV. Really? Um, yeah, their consumer guy, Rick Romero, um, was doing a story on password haystacks. Hey, that's great. Really cool. Kind of surprises uh, me, <laughs> to be well, honest. Yeah, um, well, I think it's because it, it, if understood correctly, and I hope I was able to make it clear to a, you know, a standard TV watching audience, remember that the, 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 the conceptual realization I had when I was actually working on something different, I was working on a, an interactive tool to help people design secure passcodes. I, that's when it hit me that what really mattered was length over complexity as long as the as long as the the password you had wouldn't be found in a dictionary and that meant you forced someone who really wanted to, to crack your account to do a brute force attack then what you want is the largest possible haystack for them to be searching which means 
a longer passcode or password, passphrase, whatever you want to call it. So Time Magazine had a column a couple of weeks before which mentioned coming to GRC and, and, and the Haystacks and the producer, um, Alan Gitterman of the um, of KABC here in LA, he read the page, found it over on GRC, thought, wow, wow. we should tell our viewers. That's so, amazing. So in the next day or two, they're not sure when it's going to air. I will tweet when it does um, for those who have a, have a more real-time connection to news from me. But certainly the week after, I'll, there will be a link to um, it on the KABC website for anybody who is interested. So that was cool. And it did force me to clean. Uh, if you notice, you can sort of see, like, back there, there used to be a visible pile of papers on the desk. <laughs> yes. uh, I know. You got rid of the microphone and everything. <laughs> yeah, I did, some, I did some house cleaning. It's very, However, it's very pretty. Did they do it via Skype? No, they were here. They, oh, they were they, there. And oh, cool. the cameraman is a listener. Awesome. And of course so it was he is. very cool when 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 Rick and the cameraman were were were, were walking up at the front door. He said because I had already met Rick downstairs and 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 we, he was waiting for the cameraman to show up who you know rolled up in the big bright blue KABC eyewitness news van with the antennas <laughs> sticking out the top and everything. And uh, so when when Rick and he were were approaching, he said, "Steve, our cameraman is a regular listener to security now. He knows all about you. Oh, so that was really, that was cool. And, you know, it made it also all very comfortable. And sort of Rick, I think, knew that, okay, this isn't, you know, I mean, he didn't know where I'd come from. So, you know, Rick's uh, kind of a legend really, uh, among Farkistas. But I'm, I, well, I'm, Rick I, Romero, I certainly recognize the name immediately when he, uh, when he did it. The producer. But Fark gave him a really hard time because in 2005, he did a report on the new phenomenon of blocking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, new for his viewers. It was new for him. Yeah. And, but, you know, he's made up for it because I'll tell you what, Fark doesn't even know about password haystacks probably. So that's good. He's, he's well, getting ahead of the curve now. So my... My cleaning efforts over the weekend in preparation for Monday morning's visit were slowed down uh -oh. because I could not stop reading. I said on, on the Starbucks patio, I said, okay, I'm going to read till 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. Then I said, okay, I'll, go, I'll read till 10. And, and I lost and that, that de deadline passed. And I said, okay, I'll read till 11. Then I'll read till 12. Then I'll read till 1. And, and I ended up finishing the book. Isn't it exciting? You've uh, discovered the immortal words of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Finally. <clears throat> no? Um, not Nathaniel no. Hawthorne? <laughs> not Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, <laughs> someone mentioned to me a new author yeah. and a series uh -oh. that sounded interesting. And so I tracked it down, uh, put it into Amazon, and Amazon had the, the paperbacks... But nothing on Audible, nothing on... Well, Amazon wouldn't tell me about Audible, but nothing No, actually, on, they would because they own Audible. Oh, okay. So if there's an audio uh, book, they'll often say, yeah, we can have the I, audio version. Now I don't remember whether there was, but it certainly wasn't Kindle, which is what I was looking for. Um, so I thought, well, okay, I'll just get the first one of, this, of the series of 12... Leo. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, could this be good? Damn you, Steve Gibson. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, so the first book arrives in, you know, dead tree form, pulp. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I start reading it late last week. And actually I was having dinner with Jenny and I, I left it by mistake. I was distracted and oh, left. No. I walked away from. I walked away from the restaurant uh, where I had been there reading <sighs> and uh, wait, waiting for her and, her and a friend of hers to show up. Oh dear! So I got to the car, ran back to the restaurant, and in the meantime, they had seen that I had left it and had given it to Jenny, who had driven off in her own direction. Oh! So, so, so <laughs> I sent email because I had. I was all set up to spend the morning on the patio reading some more because it was already seeming really good. So, um, so I sent e her email saying, uh, I need that book desperately because, yeah. you know, I could, if I, even if I bought another copy, it would, I couldn't get it till Saturday. So anyway, I, I Googled the name Honor Harrington hmm. ebook and it turns out it is electronic in electronic format and moreover the first two are free what? and it's in every format known to man epub uh moby uh pdf html i mean 
and it's so Bayon is the publisher, and Bayon this first book, Honor Harrington, uh, it was it's titled On Basilic Station was written in 93, I think it is. Maybe 92. We should, before people start looking for the author, Honor Harrington, you're talking about she's the heroine of David Weber. She is, she is the protagonist, yes, yeah. of David of David Weber. Now, I wanted to give credit for whomever it was that turned me on to this. After being, because Leo, oh my God. Now, I have to characterize it a little bit because it's different than the other stuff, but... Fabulous. So this morning I put Honor Harrington into my Eudora full everything search and up started popping references in the security now email folder. They've been telling you about this all along, Steve. April 7th, Serge <laughs> Beaumont, June 7th, Stephen Thompson, November 09, Matt Horton. Uh, something must have happened in December of, of, of 2010 because John Weatherby, J Gary Berg, Javier Gordo, and Dennis Sherman, oh, and Jamie, all mentioned it. Um, one, one using the, the, the subject, looking for a Perens very large sci-fi story. Then, now, wait a minute. August, uh, this can't be it. Last month. Last no, month. that's not it. Okay. Mike Lopez, Tim Leahy, John Whitlock, G. Wade Johnson, Neil uh, Lobenthal, all said, all mentioned this series, and and one saying the only sci-fi recommendations you'll ever need. Wow. So, um, and then Robert this month or er, er, earlier said good sci-fi series in the same vein as Lost Fleet. Okay, so, okay, um, the guy is a fantastic writer, and. I'm seeing words like perspicacity or perspicacity or perspicacious or, um, you know, words I haven't seen since my college skills review class in high school. Um, beautifully put together sentences. It is, it's hard sci-fi. Um, it is absolutely the most unsexist series I've ever read. Uh, Honor Harrington is a is a young woman who who uh, uh, does a great job in the first book. I, I was I couldn't put it down because I just wanted to see whether the reviews which were all glowing could be true. And now this they is neat because it looks like on Basilisk Station, which is the first, right? That you can yeah. read online. You don't even have to download it. The text is online. Yes, everything has been converted to Audible. So for those oh, who are Audible listeners, all of this is on Audible. The books get bigger toward the end. I was looking at their sizes in various. I, I, I after reading the first one, I bought. The, I, I downloaded the second <laughs> one for free, and then I bought. They, yeah, they sell them there for five dollars. However, you can also poke around the net. And find them not uh, deliberate. I mean, with au authorization, free. Yeah. Because at various points, some some of the hardbacks were published with a CD containing the full text of the prior books. So they're not locked up. None of none of this is password or or um uh uh what am I trying to say? Uh, protected. DM, DRM. Yeah. DRM. Exactly. Um. Anyway. So now they're. They're heavy on character development and sort of the political interplay and the interplay of the characters. So it's much less, you know, torpedoes firing. Good. I'm not, and, I never liked that much. Right. And and I have to, and, and what this brought me back to in mind of was back when I had a whole company of people, like 27 employees, they did something very cool for me one birthday which is I received the writer's kit for Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> um, one of them pretended to be my agent, and acting as my agent, she, she contacted Paramount and got the writer's kit. Wow. And, and, you know, the last thing I was going to do was, I mean, it would have been fun to write an episode of Star Trek Next Generation, but I did sit down and read what writers were given. And the one thing that stuck in my mind was it made it 
very clear. It said, yes, we have photon torpedoes and tractor beams and beaming and and um, a warp core that, you know, you never want to let the, the, you know, you may have to eject it if things get bad and so forth. But it said, Star Trek Next Generation is not about those things. Right. It, the stories are about people. They're about, Shocking. you know, hu human drama set in that, placed in that setting. So, you know, writers, you know, would-be writers, we caution you, we're not going to give your scripts a chance to hit the screen if you get all yourself all wound up in dilithium crystal breakdown, you know, we just, you know, Scotty has a problem with dilithium crystals every so often, and they may need to be recrystallized. We don't want to know what that means. We're more concerned about, you know, whether Scotty's going to pull this off and, right. you know, you know, Kirk is going to sleep with a green alien. That's, you know, more interesting to us. So, so this is like that. The, I, 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 am, I am wrapped with this author, with his style of writing, with his development. He's already setting up a, a fantastic scenario in book number two. Now I'm not in a hurry, because if I am, nothing else will be getting done here at GRC, and I want to get the, the off-the-grid stuff finished. Um, there's been a little delay in that, because I, ha I just had to read the first book. Um, <laughs> well, at now, least you're honest now. Now I'm now I'm now I don't want to finish them because I don't want them to be over with and I'm feeling guilty because the only reason I allowed myself to read the first one was I thought it was only available in paperback and I and I've been reserving everything that's available electronically for my stair climber to force me to work out where so I you know now if I if I if I refuse to allow myself to read these unless I'm on the stair climber I'm going to be in fantastic physical shape so anyway uh the good news is they, they are around on the net. You can, if you put in Honor Harrington ebook, uh, there's also Wikipedia entries, of course, with links to CDs, and, and you can find the text. If you don't want to pay, I happily paid $5 for the other nine of them, and the author is still at it. Uh, Wikipedia made mention of the fact that the, another book or two are coming out in 2012. So this is all alive and kicking, and oh boy. Um, if you, you know, you can get into it for free with a first book and see if it's your cup of tea, because as you said, Leo, it is, it is, it's easier than Hamilton, a little less, it's a little less techie than, 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 than Peter's stuff, but oh, really, really nice writing. And I lo really like the way he handles characterization. Uh, darn you, darn you, Steve Gibson. <laughs> So and, the if, author and if our podcasts David are late Kirk. coming out for the next three weeks, <laughs> you'll know why. Uh, it, it really is good stuff. I, so I, 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 look forward I, to. I give it. I have to admit the the covers make me think it's kind of a little bit of a romance novel, but it but it's not right. Absolutely none. In fact, we learn in the in the beginning of the second book that uh, that Honor has never really had any interest in guys and she doesn't like women it she actually says that but they're just she hasn't run across a guy yet that she's going to however i did see something in a synopsis later on where i figure he's you know, whole, he's saving his powder for later yeah oh, oh yeah it's it, it and, <laughs> and and it's been called it's been reminiscent of the hornblower novels um and in really fact, well see i was a big fan i love those kinds of novels well it is like that yeah. in fact uh, the technology uses Warshawski sails to sail along gravity waves in hyperspace. And, and, and we have her looking out of her viewport, you know, at the, at the frozen lightning appearance of, of the sails as she's sailing through hyperspace. So, and it's not overdone. I mean, it's just, oh, it's fantastic. So, you know, thank you all of you who for the last, uh, Five years have been trying to tell me about her. <laughs> Finally, and this, you paid attention. This author and series. Uh, it's and I wanted to pass the word on to all of our listeners because absolutely worthwhile stuff. And uh, just a short note from Sam in Texas who says, "Wow," he says, "I applied Spinrite to a very old hard drive that had stopped working completely. It wouldn't boot into safe mode or any other mode for that matter." And even though the drive had many unrecoverable sectors and one recoverable sector after using Spinrite, 
the drive now works. I'm very happy that this product works like it said it would. I mainly use it for drive maintenance. Keep up the good work. Sam in Texas. So, Short but sweet. Sam, thank you. Yeah. Let's quickly, before we get to uh, our questions, and we have uh, some great questions for Steve based on uh, previous conversations and other things, but I do want to mention uh, very quickly our friends at Netflix, a great place to go for television entertainment. Whether it's on your Xbox 360, your PlayStation 3, your iPad, your iPhone, now almost every Android phone, any Android phone with Froyo or later, 2.2 or later, you can watch Netflix movies. Abby's been watching Arrested Development, so they gave her some recommendations for other things that she should watch. See, this is great. $7.99 a month, $7.99 a month, and all these movies and TV shows. And I love, you know, something like going through all of the Arrested Developments one by one, like eating them like candy or Mad Men, or Glee, uh, or these classic movies. Uh, the Mona Lisa was so, with Bob Hoskins, was such a great movie. Um, just so many wonderful movies and TV shows, and kids stuff too, we should point out. Lots of great kids movies. There's Toy Story 3. Uh, you're, for, if, you're, you know, if you have an iPad and you want to, you want to keep Junior busy, <laughs> this is a great solution. Now, I know most of you already have Netflix. Uh, so if you do, thank you for your support. And if you don't, netflix.com slash twit. You can try it free for 30 days. And don't forget to tell friends and family they can get it for free for 30 days. Netflix.com slash twit. Makes a great gift, too. So get them to try it for 30 days. And if they say they like it, then you can uh, buy a gift certificate for a year. That's what I do for my mom. And it's, it's a wonderful uh, gift. Netflix.com slash twit. All right, Steve, I have questions. I know you have answers, or you wouldn't have given me these questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we got just a bunch of great stuff um, this week, so let's uh, plow in. Let's fire when ready, Gridley. Question one from Tudor Gazdak. What a great name. <laughs> About watch it work and get it done. Dear Steve, I've been watching for a while about how off the grid actually works. This was your a couple of episodes ago, your great... Um, kind of non-electronic password system. Right. That's why it's off the grid. And uh, I noticed something weird. When I selected the option, watch it work. So we should explain, when you go to Steve's website, grc.com, what is it? grc.com slash off the grid. grid dot htm. Yep. Um, it'll generate a grid, and you, there's two ways to do it. Quick, or you can see it actually happen. So that's the watch it work thing. He memorized the position of some characters as they were generated, but after it's finished generating the entire Latin square, I observed a change in the distribution of characters I had memorized. The, f the final result was totally different. A totally different Latin square from the one that was working on initially. For example, I memorized the position of three characters. OMG, capital O, lowercase m, uppercase G, as they appeared in the first column in the first row. When the Latin square got generated, the characters moved from their positions, the results being a totally new Latin square. Is this a bug? But it also can't be such a big deal. But it's something I noticed and I thought you should know. Congratulations for everything you're doing, Tudor Gazdek. So, Tudor, you and many people mentioned that and asked and so I, I so two things happened first of all i changed the way it works because it was confusing people ah. so that it no longer does that but it was deliberate and not a bug it was actually doing it in both modes but in the get it done mode you, could see you couldn't see it happen yeah 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 so, um here's the problem um the way i was generating latin squares where i'm moving through each cell and selecting from among those that are still candidates that actually results in a tiny bias from from if all of the cells in the row were chosen at once there there there's a famous logical problem um you probably are re will remember this leo and i'm not sure i'm going to get it right but it's like um, there was a game show where you had to choose oh, yeah, between yeah, yeah. what was behind door number one, door number two, and door number three. So it's counterintuitive, to be honest. Yes, and so. But your your so, first pick can actually affect your second your your second pick. Yes, which it doesn't yes. seem right because you know if you flip a coin, what happens in the first flip doesn't have anything to do with the second flip. 
Exactly. And so I think it was, it was it Alex Trebek or I don't know who it was, but somebody there, there would, you know, there would be a, you know, a, a some fantastic I think they car. did Let's Make a Deal is what they used as an example. Ah, uh, okay. Monty Hall. And so, right, Monty Hall. And so you would, you'd be try to guess, you know, like where the prize was. It was behind one of these three doors and it, you would make your guess. And then given that you weren't right, they would open one of the other doors to show or no, they would open that door. Yeah, they would open that door and show that it wasn't there where you had chosen. And you had the opportunity then to change. No, wait, you made your guess. No, here's the no, deal. So, so okay. the, player picks door, <laughs> the player picks door number one. Now, they don't open door number one. That's well, not how, exactly. you, if you've ever watched Let's Make a Deal, what they do is they open exactly. another door, let's say right. door three, to reveal a goat. And then they say... <laughs> Do you want to stick with door number one, or would you like to change your pick to door number two? Exactly. And if you study game theory, you uh, apparently understand, because I've never understood this, that you should always switch. Yes, and that, that is... to your advantage to switch. Now, it seems to me it doesn't make any sense, because whether there's a goat behind three or not, <laughs> why should you switch? Exactly. Right. And, and what's really freaky, Leo, is you can... If you 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 can do this with you can coins, prove it. Yep. you can prove that it actually matters. Anyway, so that's kind of what was going on with the way the grids are being made because the characters at the end have less choices because the characters that preceded them on the line have already taken those choices up. So, and again, it's like counterintuitive, but we we some of the guys in the news group where we were when I was working on all this demonstrated it. I produced a whole bunch of four by four Latin squares and they counted them up. And sure enough, they were not equally distributed. There was a bias to this, uh, this approach toward generating them. So the Monte Carlo problem, which is the other way you describe this, uh, right. bit you. Yes. And so what I decided to do was once I had arrived at a square, at, at a completely finished Latin square, I would randomly permute every row and every column so that I take so that I, I get a, a an extremely impossible to predict incredibly high entropy Latin square then I take then I have another empty grid and I randomly copy the columns into randomly chosen other columns and then I and in order to make a new grid and then I, I randomly copy rows from the, this new one back into the original one in a random sequence. So that, that permutes all the rows and all the columns to completely remove the fact that there was an otherwise a detectable bias in the way that these grids were being generated, even though it really doesn't matter. But, you know, I'm a perfectionist and I want this to be just nailed down the right way. So... That's what we, that's what people were seeing was they would because the watch at work mode plunks the characters out slowly and you you could memorize the beginning of the grid as it's working down further down below then suddenly I would perform this this permutation that completely results in yet another grid it is a variant of the first one and it's necessary to go through that first process in order to have a chance to get to all possible grids so this just you know is a short little hyperspace jump essentially to the final grid which people were seeing it no longer does that because uh, uh <laughs> because it really didn't matter um for, <laughs> like for people who wanted who wanted awesome, to see it work awesome awesome question two john benson from twitter at J Benson two wonders some uh, I love the Twitter questions because they're 140 characters. <laughs> some pro none of this love the we're show. About make, we're about to make up for it though. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> some program logins ask for my Twitter or Facebook username and password. Seems risky. Could you comment on security? Okay, now? so that's a really good question, and I'm seeing it more and more too. There was somewhere I was looking the other day that off offered me the option of logging in using my Twitter or Facebook account. Now, what hopefully what John is talking about, certainly what, what the page I was looking at was talking about, 
was something we have done a show on called OAuth yeah. or Open Authentication. So, so you should know that in the early days of Twitter, they did not require OAuth, but they now do. So anytime you give your Twitter credentials to anybody, you're not giving it to anybody. You're giving it to Twitter, which is then sending an OAuth token to that third-party site. Well, Twitter doesn't allow. Okay. Twitter does not allow this third-party login anymore. There, there's a. The, the way it works, though, you still, you should absolutely never put your Twitter or Facebook oh, or yeah, other right. site <laughs> into a page other than Twitter or Facebook. Somebody could trick you into saying, oh, we'll do it for you, but they can't. So if they're asking you for that, they're stealing it. Exactly. So, yeah. so, so, John and, and anybody else who's confused by this, when you say, yes, I would like to use my Twitter or Facebook authentication to authenticate to the, to this other third party site when you, when you click one of those buttons you will be taken to Twitter or Facebook there you're logging in with Twitter or Facebook assuming that you weren't already logged in like statically and then you're brought back and what the so what the open auth uh, authentication protocol does is behind the scenes it allows that site you were going to authenticate to via a site that already, where you already have credentials established, it allows them to exchange things, but you yourself are, should only ever provide that authentication to the site that you are intending to authenticate to, and then you bounce back to the third-party site, and it'll say, oh, okay, fine, you know. Facebook has said they know who you are. Twitter has said they know who you are. And now we have a token that represents who you are. So the, and it is completely secure. Yeah. And you, yeah, you should know that the, I think both Twitter and Facebook have deprecated any other form of uh, authentication. You have to. They, so if somebody's saying, oh, we'll do it for you, that's a lie. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. never want to provide your credentials no. to, you no know, other than the site that, that, where you are known by that credential. I guess they could spoof Twitter, but you should be able to tell that it's a Twitter. It oh, often... you'll abs you ought to have an HTTPS connection. Right, right. You ought to be able to ver you know, verify the uh, credentials right. of the page by looking at, at the SSL certificate and go through the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now the long one. From Simon Bartholomew's from Melbourne, Australia, with a troubling and true, because you confirmed it, a tale of widespread, sophisticated, attempted social engineering exploitation. Ow. <laughs> Steve and Leo, I'm a long-time listener of the show and I've been dying for an opportunity. I'm not going to do it the whole way that way. An opportunity and, and to write actually, in. He actually wrote Q Australian accent. <laughs> oh, that's not that you? Was, he said that? No, that, that was him. It finally happened on a Saturday evening as I was watching the football. And he, wasn't, he was watching Australian rules, no doubt. Go Cats. While watching TV, the home telephone line rang, suspicious that it would be one of the usual telemarketing parasites. I answered the phone anyway, looking forward to the opportunity to vent some frustration. I guess the cats were losing. Mm. Sure enough, I was immediately presented with a dial tone that transferred me through to a young man with an Indian accent called Carl. Carl explained that he worked for an organization that had been monitoring the security of my computer. Oh, yeah, you know what? This is happening all over because I've gotten yes. calls on the radio show about this. And could confirm that it was infected with malicious software. Now, of course, Simon's a listener. So he immediately said, and it's a little odd that he could figure out which one, given I have a bunch of computers behind a router. He knew the name of my girlfriend who lives with me, presumably from the phone book, and stated that I am here to help. <laughs> yeah, right. Having been a listener of the show, the word scam immediately came to mind, but I continued to indulge my curiosity. Carl told me to boot up my computer. And I guess he did it, which is great. While it was booting, he explained that 98% of the files on your computer are corrupted, whatever that means. He also explained that he worked for a company based in North Sydney that had been involved in monitoring security software that had been installed in my computer before it was sold to me. Quite farcical, since I was booting up a Mac that had been reformatted umpteen times over. We, <laughs> we booted up the computer into Windows. I'm a dual booter. And uh, I was immediately told to hit Windows R to load up the run box and type Event Viewer, E-V-E-N-T-V-W-R. That was quite funny. He directed me to the application log and explained that all the error and warning events were instances of Windows telling me my computer was truly infected. Bugger all! 
Then back to the run box. I was told to type INF. INF, of course, stands for infected files. That's what I was told. <laughs> Can you see a lot of .inf and .pnf files in the INF directory? I was asked. These are corrupted files. I was asked to double-click one of the PNF files. When Windows brought up a dialogue saying it didn't know how to open the file, this was taken as further damning evidence my computer had indeed been taken over. Amazed that the Russian mafia could so easily have compromised my system, I asked Carl what to do to fix this seemingly dire, utterly hopeless situation. Sure enough, there was a solution. Go to the run box and type www.ammyy.com. I obviously knew better than to go to a website I knew nothing about in circumstances such as these. At this point, I told Carl as much, giving him a polite piece of my mind, and I explained that I would immediately ring the police. <laughs> I was, it gets better. I was transferred to his superior, another man with an Indian accent, who transferred me to his superior, an angrier man with an Indian accent, who explained that he was happily to patch the police in right now. I said... All right, go ahead, mate. Then after being on hold for five minutes, I decided to hang up and leave it at that. 30 seconds of Googling AMMYY.com made it clear that the initial goal of the scam was to load up remote control software on my PC. In fact, uh, Steve, you checked this, and that is a uh, free desktop access program. Yep. What frustrates me about this nonsense is I know plenty of otherwise intelligent people who would probably fall for this sort of scam, unknowingly handing over their bank account details and openly handing control of their computer across to join the ranks of some botnet army. If I have a question out of any of this is, what can ordinary people do to stop these people? I don't take sufficient comfort in the fact that I can protect myself. Security now has plenty of devoted followers. There must be something we can all do to proactively cut the heads off the Hydra. Well, you know what happened when that happened. Anyway, on a much more positive note, I just want to say thank you to both of you for your efforts on the show. My reading list over the past 12 months, Peter F. Hamilton, Daniel Suarez, and Fatal System Error have been purely Security Now inspired. That's amazing. We've taken over his reading list. Moreover, the show has further inspired me to take a much broader interest in computer science with many hours spent playing around with MSM and better understanding some of the most fascinating technological phenomenon of our time. I might even load up on vitamin D supplements. <laughs> Man, this guy's devoted. <laughs> if either of you are ever in Melbourne, let me know, and I'll happily take you to a footy game. My shout. Kind regards, Simon Bartholomew's Bell Melbourne. Well, good news. I'm going to be in Melbourne in November, Simon, and I'm going to count on that footy game. Because you know what? Footy, Australian rules football, is by far the best sport ever invented by God or man, with the exception perhaps of Quidditch. So, Steve, I have gotten this call on the radio show numerous times. So it's not just Australia. They do this worldwide. Uh, probably there's a, there's a large group of uh, out-of-work call uh, center <laughs> uh, guys who they just say, hey, in between, you know, Dell, supporting Dell calls, why don't you make these? Well, yeah. And, you know, if you do Google, as I did, A-M-M-Y-Y, up comes all kinds of of people saying, for example, you know how how, how Google does little summaries, um, and I'm 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 looking here. It says, "Help! A guy just rang our phone and asked my wife to turn on our PC. She hung up. It rang again, and a guy said he was calling as some error. Dot dot dot. Another one, uh, December eighth, twenty ten. Someone claiming to be from Microsoft phones you at yeah. home and tells you their yeah. logs are picking up an infection <laughs> from your computer. Blah blah blah. I mean, th there's like. People are falling for this and getting caught out by it. Well, and, and I don't worry about our audience. I know they are smart enough, but I do worry about the radio show audience. And I suppose I should just make a blanket warning every single episode because those are the people they're going after, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and I didn't know you could type E-V-E-N-T-V-W-R and immediately bring up Windows Event Viewer, but it works. Well, they know. And so, <laughs> yeah. so it's a very clever way of of bringing, you know, like getting buy-in from pure social engineering attack, getting buy-in from a Windows user, and here's somebody who says, first of all, we're monitoring your security, I'm, we're going we're gonna to prove it to you, and he brings up this log, you know, those, and the Windows event viewer is always full of a bunch of random nonsense that isn't working right, or something didn't start up, or tried to boot, or who knows what. So, I mean, it, they're like, they're, I can totally see that they would... They, they would be bringing a person along and allow 
someone to believe that their system was in bad shape. And I, I don't, who knows what happens? I'm, I'm interested to know what happens if you do download the desktop, remote desktop stuff, and they probably connect to your system. Somehow they're going to have to get money from you. So they probably drag you along and say, oh, well, yeah, now they're, you know, we're taking over your cursor and, and, and poke around and do magic looking incantations and then say, oh, well, now we need your credit card number and we'll, we'll fix the problem for you. I had a call uh, on the radio show in wow. May from uh, Mike, who is in Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, he had exactly the same call, but he had the good sense to record it. Ah. So you can listen a little bit if you're, if you're curious. It's on YouTube. It's, if you search for Windows Service Center phone call scan. You had received a call from the Windows Service Center, and we are the associate of all the, all the Windows operating system all over the world. And the reason why we are calling you because as we have been receiving a lot of errors in the warning reports from We've the received a lot of error reports from uh -huh. the computer you're so using. It's the same script, I believe. Which has been malfunctioning with the other operating system and the operating system and there is a software corruption going on. So that's the precise reason it's a checkup call given to you. Okay? Right. So then he, this is exactly uh, what Sorry. you described. Yeah. It's funny. I'm in Scotland, Australia. I think it's uh, it's all over the place. I I'm sorry it's not louder, yeah. but you you can hear Mike uh, talking to them. And can we off icon media screen, Mr. Ellis? Sorry. Can you see all the icons in your? Screen? It's such a it's such an elaborate scam. I'll let I'll let you folks uh, go and and uh, and watch Mike's video. It's Windows Service Center C E N T R E uh, phone call scam. Uh, and apparently there are quite a few of these on YouTube. If, you, if you'd like to know, you know, what these sound like, maybe just send the link to uh, friends and family. Uh, Mike did a great job of documenting this with video and everything. It's, it's fascinating, well, And it's been it? going on for about at least three quarters of a year because here's one that was posted on December 8th of 2010. Yeah. I'm so, I, I just can't understand how these people haven't been shut down. It's just mind-boggling. Well, I'll tell you how they haven't been shut down. It's... it's uh, it's international. You know, in the U.S., if you call, if you get a solicitor's call you uh, by law, you could say, put me on your do not call list, and it would be a violation right. of federal law for them to call you back, unless they're in Bangalore. Then yeah. what do you do? And I think one of the reasons this works is because cheap international calling using voice over IP, they can afford yeah. to do this, you know, because you got to remember that it costs them both the time of a, a person to make this call, the phone call itself. They must get some pretty good paybacks out of it, I would guess. Yeah. Wow. Wow is right. Anyway, I wanted to bring it to our listeners' Thank attention you. just because it was, you know, from the bizarro world from, yeah. from our perspective. But, but Leo, Leo, I bet it works. Uh, it's the real world. Here's yeah. question for a worried listener who uh, has asked for anonymity. He's in India. He says, Steve, I'm a listener in India and follow your podcast very regularly. Thanks for the information. By the way, I just want to apologize for the bad Australian and Indian accents of the previous letter. <clears throat> Didn't know we had any Indian listeners. Oh, boy. Uh, we thanks. A lot. <laughs> I know, we do. I'm just kidding. Thanks for the information you share as I drive around for long hours. I have a query that relates to TCPIP, and I'd be grateful if my email ID and name are not disclosed. Recently, I was approached by the police who traced my IP address for some harassing emails sent to an individual. I was pretty surprised. I was sure it was a mistake. How can a security focused listener fall for hacks, right? Well, it turned out that the authorities had traced one of many emails to my IP and other emails are being evaluated. The only outcome possible is that all emails end up being traced back to my broadband connection or to random people. I'm hoping it's the latter. I have an ADSL 2 megabits line that plugs into an integrated modem and wireless router. The model is a Beetle router provided by the telecom company, but I believe my question is independent of the model being used. I was using WPATKIP for protection. That's good. Made sure that all services, Telnet, HTTP, TFTP, were only available to the LAN, not the WAN. That's good. Yep. I thought I was secure, and I didn't bother to change the default router admin password. Big, big mistake. I started exploring my router in more detail from an independent Internet connection. If I typed the IP address of my router in the browser, I was prompted for the username and password and was promptly taken to my admin page which, needless to say, required only the default password. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know what the definition of 
is of WAN for my router. My modem has an option for showing the password as plain text. Sounds like a terrible modem. I know. So uh, from the Internet, my password was visible along with a hidden SSID. To make things worse, my ADSL PPOE username is my phone number at my service provider name. So if somebody hacked into my router, he now has my SSID, my password, my phone number. Of course, that could be uh, used to obtain my address through social engineering, even though my IP is dynamic. So now I have a reason to believe my router had been hacked. Now, I do understand I'm a vulnerable, but the hacker needs to get in close proximity to my house. He just needs to be on the Wi-Fi in order to use my router for malicious intentions. My question to you as a security expert is follows. I don't know if does he need to use the Wi-Fi. That may not be the case. Well, we'll ask Steve. No, I don't think so. Yep. Yeah, I think he could do that over the Internet. Mm -hmm. Assuming my machine was not compromised by altering the uh, DNS or other means, whether a router could be configured such that a hacker is able to bounce his IP traffic off my router so that it looks like I am the center of the email. I explored the DMZ, NAT, and virtual server protocols. They didn't seem to fill the bill. The router, which is a Broadcom router, which has a f with a fancy marketing name, all, so it's Broadcom based, I guess, uh, also has a Linux prompt and has very basic commands, one of which is IP tables, which is a Linux firewall. I'm really going bonkers while trying to narrow down whether the hacker came in close proximity to my house or did the bouncing of packets remotely. Is the latter possible as it is more convenient? And if so, what protocol should I be looking into? My router VPN is not supported in my router, which was a suggestion provided by one of my friends. Please note that cyber investigations in India are pretty new and naive, and authorities believe an IP trace implicates the router owner even if you've never met the person who has received the malicious emails. Spoofing, ability to hack WPA, the way I described above, are really beyond comprehension for the police. And uh, any insight you could provide with regards to IP routing that affects my everyday users is going to be greatly appreciated. Please do keep up the good work. Boy, I feel for this guy. And I uh, hope you bump up this question for the upcoming podcast. I'm looking forward to your views on this unfortunate episode. It's really nerve-wracking. and It's making me angry. He has changed the default password. Now, I guess I have a question. They don't really need to hack his router to spoof his IP address, do they? Can well, you just yeah. spoof that? Uh, no, because email uses TCP, and you need to establish a connection before you're able to send traffic over TCP. So unlike UDP, like, like DNS queries, where, where it's a one-way transit, um, somehow... Um, you actually have to have a the three-way handshake that we discussed last week has to complete, and that does prevent IP addresses from being spoofed. Now, he said, first of all, he said his IP was dynamic. So although typically IPs are not changing often, I'm my first thought is who had the IP at the time that these emails were being sent? Because uh -huh. well, that's it a may good well point. It might not have been him. Yes, exactly. I mean, that, that would be the first thing I would say. However, the fact that he was able to log on to his router's administration page from outside on the Internet knowing his current IP is obviously a huge concern. Um, it's, for example, what Shields Up is designed, you know, GRC's Shields Up service is designed to detect that and would. So if he were to go to, to Shields Up and just run a scan, he would come up with a red, a red box on port 80 saying that you've got an HTTP server running on this IP address, which is accepting TCP connections from anybody. And so... Oh, well, that's you know, interesting. You, so you, that's one of the things you'd see in Shields Up is that there's uh, access from externally. And it, and it shows up as port 80. Exactly. Ah. Yes, because it would just be, it's a web page. you know, he, yeah, exactly. He said he went to a different web browser and typed in his IP address and got his page. So that means he's, he's got a web server exposed to the internet and Shields Up would, you know, would, would make that very obvious that that was going on. So if, if any other listener wants to make sure that they're not in the same situation, uh, you know, GRC Shields Up service, it's been around forever, uh, it, designed to, to let people know. Yeah. Um, now, as to could a router bounce traffic or be involved somehow, the fact that it's got Linux in it means that it's potentially got the power to do that. But 
in order to bounce a connection, you actually have to have a proxy of some sort. You have to have the router able to accept a connection and then it reissue another connection on your behalf from its IP. That way, the connection to a remote SMTP server would be terminated at the router's IP. And it's unlikely that, I mean, that's not typical software in a router that's available over on the WAN side. So it's, it's unlikely that that would be going on. And by the way, I'm looking at the traffic to GRC and everyone who's listening to the podcast just started using Shields Up at <laughs> Including once. Including me, by the way. Just <laughs> My iDent port is turned on. Uh, you know, we're using an ASG. The only thing bad about having an iDent port turned on is that it does identify that there's a router at that IP address. It, it, exa exactly. It demonstrates that it's not just an un a disconnected IP. Right. But uh, presume the only the only possible problem would be if if there was a bug in the in the iDent server that's like a buffer overflow that right. someone could then go oh you know. We, let, let's see if there are any known problems that the IDENT server has, that, yeah. you know, that kind of problem. Otherwise, we're uh, fully stealth. Of course, we're using ASGs, so I think yeah. we're pretty safe. I'm not too worried about that. Yeah, and of course, IDENT open is necessary for some connections to be completed on other ports. Often, as, as often chats and things like that. In the last couple of weeks, yeah. 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 So, um, so my, my best guess is, first of all, it's nice that he knows that he was exposed. Hopefully, he's able to, I mean, he, 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 can, he can use Shields Up to verify that WAN side access is shut down. Certainly, that's better than changing his password. And, wow, I would worry if you believe you've turned off WAN side access, but it's, it hasn't been turned off, that's a problem. So, um, so there's that. And secondly, it's... It's really unlikely that a proxy is or was running in your browser unless it's very sophisticated. But he said he doesn't support um, uh, VPN connections. And, and I, I can't imagine a WAN side proxying service that would be part of a router, which is what would be necessary in order to, to loop traffic through someone's router. You know, just spoofing wouldn't work. So I think it's more, the most likely scenario is that somebody else previously had his IP. And I would just tell the police, hey, verify. It's dynamic, with, dudes. Yeah, yeah. With the IP that it, it, they, they do change and somebody had it before him. There's nothing more scary than a government authority with half knowledge of technology. Uh, That's just yeah. terrifying. Uh, yeah. Boy, you, you, you have our uh, support and sympathy and... So it's not possible to spoof headers than an email, at least as far as the servers go. Um, you can spoof headers, but you're going to finally send it to the SMTP server that will then deliver it. And that last header cannot be spoofed because it's, it's right. putting the header on and then, and then sending it on. So the so, intermediate servers could be spoofed. Yes, but not the final, the ultimate server or the first server. See, what could um, the originating server be spoofed? It's actually a chain of servers um, where the the first header is. It, 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 it's a chain of servers where um, headers are are successively added to the list, and um, but the, the the one that really matters cannot be spoofed. It's only the, okay. the previous headers. We're assuming, of course, that the police understand that, which doesn't oh, sound like goodness, they, yes. they're not even close. No. At least, hey, they, they, they looked at the headers. Ben yeah. in uh, Reading, UK, wants to implement off the grid for Android devices. I'd support that. Stephen Lee, I want to create an Android application for generating those Latin squares you use in off the grid, which can be then used to generate a password, as you explained in episode 315. The original idea was to use a master password to somehow seed the generation of the grid. But following discussions on episode 316, uh, I realized that this would significantly reduce the number of possible squares. The revised decision on the design of the application is, when it first runs, a Latin square will be generated and saved. The square will be both generated and saved locally on the device. When the user wants to access it, they could provide a master password to unlock the saved square then they enter a website address which will use the square automatically to generate the password. 
The user will have the option to select a starting square from the grid after entering their password and the website address. That's nice. I like that feature. The way I see it is, in order for someone to obtain your password for a site, they would have to A, have your phone, B, have the master password to unlock the square, and selecting a square to start with, I am not considering an extra level of security because there's only 26 by 26 different starting locations to choose from. Still, that's a fairly large number. So it would take some time, perhaps enough for you to change your passwords because your phone was lost. I realize if someone does steal your phone and knows what they are doing, they might be able to somehow extract the Latin square, removing the need to even enter a password. But I can't think of a way to overcome that. Does this seem like a secure approach? Anything I'm missing? Is, is this how you would implement this, Steve? Okay, so here's what I would do. Uh, first of all, he's, he's right that using a master password just doesn't have enough entropy in it for the, for the Latin square generation. So, and, and some people have said, hey, you know, will we be able just to use our own password to create a Latin square? And I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to provide for that option because I really want there to, part of the security of the system is that there are just so many, you know, 10 to the 428 or whatever that number was, a ridiculous number of possible Latin squares. That's where it does get some of its security. So we can't use a passphrase to to directly seed the generation of the Latin square. The the what I would do and what I will suggest Ben does is use a good pseudo random number generator and I've got one that is I developed in JavaScript and that's public domain and I'm encouraging people to take it and use it. That's the ultra high entropy pseudo random number generator that we talked about a week or two ago which is posted on my website. If you go to offthegrid.htm, down at the bottom is a link to a page that shows that. So that generates 1,536-bit um, um, based pseudorandom numbers from a key of that size, 1,536 bits, which when it's base 64 encoded is 256 characters. So that's a big long, that's that, that 256 character ASCII blob is your master password or the actually the key which then generates the squares. That you could encrypt using a passphrase. So you, so that's arrived at that, that 256 character key is arrived at pseudo randomly, and that's what is used to key the Latin square generator. That then you symmetrically encrypt using a passphrase. So the beauty of that is that if someone got your phone, they could put in a passphrase and it would decrypt to some key that would generate some Latin square and not yours. So you know, they would get a Latin square and they would have no way of knowing if it was the right one. Only when you put in the proper passphrase would it decrypt that 1,536 bits into the proper key to result in the proper Latin square. So it's actually sort of nice because nothing is on the phone that is that can be taken from you. Your passphrase decrypts the, 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 the encrypted key into something. Any passphrase will decrypt it into something. It just will always be the wrong something unless it's the proper passphrase. But even the wrong something will happily generate a Latin square. It'll just be the wrong Latin square. And then they're really up the creek because then they have to start, you know, using the wrong Latin square to try to guess your passwords and those won't work either. So it's kind of cool. Good solution. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this app. Ship it. Yep. And I, I, I meant to mention also. I bet many there's people, others. Yeah. Many people have expressed an interest in in turning this into an app where you put in the domain name and it gives you out the password. So basically, it automates that 
the whole Latin square path following process. And I like that because you have that for convenience. It's not so much off the grid any longer. No, that is, it's, yeah. you know, it's now in your phone. But you, but I like the idea then of also having the same Latin square printed out and folded up and you know tucked away in your desk drawer or stuck in your wallet. So you always have that as a fallback doing the same thing that you have automated with your smartphone. I use, so a, kinda... I use a web-based solution called Super Gen Pass mm -hmm. that hashes. You use a master password, which never changes, and it hashes that with the domain you're at, grc.com, right. to generate a unique password. I don't know, you know, I mean, it's not completely clear how secure it is and so forth, but um, it's good enough for me. I don't use it on the, on the bank and stuff like that but it seems good enough good. for me and it's automated and it comes from, because it's a web based I can use it on any device including my mobile phone right <clears throat> moving right along question six from another Australian we get I love it that we have listeners all over the world we sure it's fantastic. do fantastic India England Australia and Alabama coming up next but first Richard Wilkinson in Sydney wonders why so many certificate stores What's the point of so many certificate stores? He's talking about, I think, CAs, right? Certificate authorities. Uh, no, like storage spots for certificates oh. in a computer. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Why isn't there just one for the operating system and the browser queries that? Actually, that's how Apple does it. What is the advantage of having separate stores for each browser if there were just one operating system managed store, one update, do it for all of them? That's a that's good exactly question. That's, right. a, that's a legit question, although I presume that Google wants their own store and Firefox wants its own store and have Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's exactly right. I think there are, there are two motivations. One is that, that some, you know, many of these browsers are deliberately and by design cross-platform. Right. Firefox runs on Mac, PC, Linux, Unix, Sun machines, you know, it's it's multiple multiple platform, and so they have their code base, which includes their certificate store, and so they're managing them as a whole. So when you when you add a third party browser, you're off. It's off, often bringing along along its own certificate store. Now, as you mentioned last week, Leo, it's not necessarily the case because, for example, Safari on Windows uses the Windows Certificate Store, just as IE does. And I think that Opera does also. But, but many times a browser, a third party browser, will just bring its own along. Um, and so on one hand, part of it is that it, they, they're often open source and multi-platform. And I think the second part is that it's in the politics of browser vendors, third-party browser vendors who are doing their own browser, part of their whole philosophy is, well, we're doing one because we want control. We want to decide what add-ons operate and how they operate. Right. We want, you know, we want, to, we, we want to control the features. And so I don't, I, I think they, they proactively don't want to rely on the platform's certificate store and whatever policies it may have. For example, Firefox on Mac was secure against the DigiNotar problem several weeks mm -hmm. before Safari Precisely. on the Mac Precisely. was. Precisely. So Firefox doesn't wait till Apple, want to wait till Apple fixes it. They want right. to fix it. Right. That gives them a selling point, too. Not that they're selling yep. anything. Uh, okay. Question seven. Ronald Stepp, Enterprise, Alabama. He wonders about what he calls, quote, an interesting potential furball service. <laughs> In other words, Dropbox client-side encryption. Just picked up on this article about a new service called BitCasa. It is, by the way, I know exactly where he picked up on it because it was TechCrunch that wrote about it heavily. Uh, in fact, yeah, he gives us the link because it was, and interestingly enough, of course, it's a TechCrunch investment. Uh, and they wrote so many very positive articles about it, each of which ended with, and by the way, we have an investment in BitCasa. And it's like, come on, guys, stop that. Uh, anyway, it's promising, seamless and integrated, unlimited, infinite cloud storage of everything on your hard drive, terabytes or petabytes even. They say they will encrypt it client-side, so it's P or PI, pre-internet encryption, 
But that one way they minimize costs is they can find out which files are duplicated across different users' machines and then only store one copy of it. What? The secu <laughs> that makes no sense. But okay, the security concern and what makes it interesting, plus lots of people are pointing it out in this article, is this. If you're encrypting the stuff client-side, how is it possible they securely eliminate duplicates by comparing files encrypted with different keys? A lot of good posts there in the discussion at the bottom of the page, techcrunch.com slash slash blah, blah, blah. Thought you might get a kick out of it. Well, obviously, that's patent nonsense, right? Well, it can be done. Really? Um, and I wanted, uh, so Ronald has his name on this question, but I wanted to acknowledge all of the people who have tweeted ever since TechCrunch did this. People saying, hey, Steve, how is this possible? How can it be possible for them to claim that they cannot decrypt the files. Oh, that I is, think yeah, and, Stride and, got it in our ch in our chat room already. I'm curious to see if he's right. Go ahead. Sorry. I'll be surprised if he if if it could have been explained so quickly because we're about to have a, <laughs> oh, a really? serious pro oh, well, propeller well, head dis discussion. He said, "What if you generate a hash before encryption?" Yes, that's that's part of the solution. Okay, but but then you still can't. How can you only store one copy? That's the hard part. Oh, good point. How, so, um, oh, you're okay, right. So, you could you could know it's the same, but it but you couldn't. Yeah, okay, good. So that's part one. Okay. So so they I went to their site to to track this down, and they make a big point of saying first of all they have twenty patents. Well, we're about to bust one of them, or maybe <laughs> more than one, because I'll tell everybody how we could do this. And I'm sorry if they got a patent on it. You know, well, but the uh, patents the, the disclose how, patents disclose how you do it. So yeah. they're protected. Yeah, but uh, but again, the, the problem is patents are also supposed to be non-obvious to someone trained in the art. Oh, and you figured and, it out, yeah. You know, so point. if someone just asks me how we do this, I'll tell them how we do it. It's, it's obvious. Uh, but they didn't ask me. Um, and it may it, uh, some listeners may feel that they deserve a patent after they hear how it, how it can be done. Okay. So they make a, a point of saying that they cannot respond to subpoenas, that this stuff is truly secure, even if they were in coerced to provide anything to any government agency, they can't, which means they do not have the keys, period. They're also saying that they are eliminating duplicates and that the reason they can offer for $10 a month truly, absolutely infinite storage is there only is that so many copies of files are duplicated that they're not having to store duplicates? So on one hand, they're saying they don't have the key, which means that what they're storing is pseudo-random nonsense that is completely opaque to them. On the second hand, they're saying that they're doing duplicate elimination so that multiple people having the same file are are able to store. Um, or, or, or able to access it even though it has a single copy. Boy, this seems like something we should make a contest out of for next week. Like, how would you do this? Because I'm, I tell you, it's uh, obvious to you maybe, but I'm, I'm racking my brain now. I mean, the hash makes sense, but how do you store a duplicate? Okay, so here's one way it could work. And I just thought about this when I was assembling the questions this morning, and I thought, okay, well, I could solve the problem. So all users have a private key and a public key and the public key being public is part of their account information so they that the on the client on the user's computer it generates a an asymmetric encryption key pair one is kept private one is public and is sent up to bitcasa so first user wants to store some files up there. So his files are blocked at certain sizes. And we've talked about blocking, which, you know, take a large file, break it down into one meg or four meg or a, you know, whatever size big chunks you want. That prior to encryption is hashed. So everyone agrees. So that, that, that's sort of the easy part is we're going to take the block and hash it to create a fingerprint of the pre-encrypted data, the plain text data. Now we generate a random 256-bit key, which we'll use to encrypt that block. And, and that random key 
is um, the the user has it. That is, he the user keeps this random key and sends the block and the pre-encrypted hash up to to Bitcasa, and they say, "Thank you very much. We're storing this. We don't know what it is, but we have its fingerprint." And remember that the fingerprint, the signature, the hash tells them it uniquely identifies it from all the other possible ones but they still don't they have no idea what the content is they don't have a file name they don't have anything just a blob so so they so this user has lost no security now somebody else user b comes along signs up for for bitcasa downloads the client and says i want to store this big file up there his client breaks the file up into big blocks, makes a hash, and 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 um, and this uh, here now there are a couple of ways it could work. But but suppose the hash goes first. Um, Bitcasa has all these hashes indexed and says, "Hey, we already have a hash that matches." So we're holding a block which was encrypted under a key we don't have but we know who does have the key so so um so they take user b's public key and send it to user a asking user a to please encrypt the randomly chosen symmetric key for the following block under user B's public key which nobody but user B can decrypt using their private key and that allows the and, and so then Bitcasa sends that back to user B who decrypts that who decrypts this private key that user A had under which was encrypted with user B's public key, decrypts it with his private key. Now he has the key to the block. With he, he never needed to upload it. He merely needed to say, I have the following hash. Now he has a key to the block, which gives him access to that file. So the, the block only needed to be sent to Bitcasa once, and then only tiny keys are sent around. And the, the, the problem of user A maybe not being online is solved by the fact that, in fact, very quickly, hundreds and thousands of users will all be sharing the same blocks. Mm. It so also, and somebody in the chat room is pointing this out, and I think this is an interesting, tell me if this is not right. If authorities got any one user's key, they'd have access to that file from all the users. Uh, yes, except that's not a liability because um, it's not a li it's not a liability because it's just like any other file system. So, so um, uh, I'm trying to think. So it is the case that there's metadata which Bitcasa is storing, which knows which users have sh are sharing which blobs. Right. But Bitcasa themselves cannot decrypt the blobs. No, they'd have to get, so authorities would have to go to one of the key holders. Yes, one of the key holders. And, and then the authorities would be able to, you know, just like going to your computer. And, and we assume also that there's some login process and so forth. So if that user didn't give up that information, then the authorities would still not be able to have anything. So it, it is possible to, to share hashes of plain text and to arrange so that the randomly chosen keys are never in Bitcass's possession, yet they could arrange a, a socially networked key sharing service using public key right. technology that would make the whole system work. So the so, scenario, for instance, that would be pot potentially risky for you as a user, let's say, I mean, it would, let's say uh, the Hurt Locker. 
which is a film that the owners of which have been very aggressive about ah, suing very people. good point. If so you, yes. I have a copy of The Hurt Locker. I upload it, and 50 other people also upload their copy of The Hurt Locker. The yep. authorities can't go to BitCasa and say, well, who are these people? But they can get a list of everybody. They can find, if any one of us <laughs> says, here's the key, they can then verify that all 50 people have The Hurt Locker. Right. And from BitCasa, they can subpoena the information that these 50 people have this file. Right. Now, using the scenario I painted, all I was trying to do was to solve what little we know about this. It's not even in beta yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully, they will... Oh, here's a good one. Web 7888 says, what if the authorities upload a copy of the Hurt Locker? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually okay, well, a great now, scenario because now they have a key. It, okay, they, they have a key, except they would still need Bit, BitCasa to tell them everybody who is sharing that block and th but where Casa they are one of the people sharing does the block. know that, so they could be subpoenaed for that information. I so don't this is, see how BitCasa could not know that. So we don't know. We're guessing about how they're doing it, but assuming that they're doing this with this eminently reasonable way, if what your concern is is that you want to keep a copy of a pirated movie that uh, that is a problem on your site, all the authorities have to do is upload a duplicate. And then and they everybody have a key. sharing it would, could, uh, would, would yeah, everybody sharing that file would be potentially taggable. And all they then do is they subpoena Bitcos and say, by the way, who else has this file? Right. Okay. Interesting. We don't know if that's maybe, how they're doing it. Maybe it's even fancier. And I hope that. But 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 all I was trying to do was to solve those features that that seemed contradictory. And in fact, we can see how public there is a way to do it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Somebody in the chat room says, oh, well, then it's obvious. This is being funded by the uh, Recording Industry Association of America, the MPAA. That's how they could do it for free. <laughs> Moving along, question eight. Tim Miller and his son in the Bay Area of California rely upon, from last week, possibly hackable Medtronic insulin pumps. Steve, I'm a Sprint Ride owner and user, listener since the beginning, etc., etc., etc. I love the podcast. I'm a type 1 diabetic on the Minimed pump. Regarding Medtronic's defensive reply about users hearing the pump's beep while it's audible, I don't always hear it. We were talking about the fact that you could hack the pump remotely. Not, so, not too remotely, but, but you could hack the pump. Uh, and Medtronic said, well, yeah, but we have audible beeps whenever the pump is reprogrammed. So the user would go, oh, yeah, somebody's messing with my pump. Uh, while it's audible, I don't always hear it. My 10-year-old son is also on the mini-med. He ignores or doesn't hear it beeping half the time either. My wife is the one who says, uh, I hear beeping, you should check your pumps. It beeps for all warning signals, by the way, which include low battery, low insulin, reminder to check your blood sugar, etc. So, of course, I'm concerned about uh, this possible threat. The serial number that's required for the threat is a 10-digit alphanumeric number. However, it appears that four of the digits are always alphabetic. Maybe the model number, since mine and my son's are the same. And the other six characters appear to be numeric. So if the hacker only has six digits, and if the pump replies, this is a very fast crack to get into a pump. Leo's correct about the pump range. You do have to be close to the insulin pump for radio reception. I found the max to be about 20 to 30 feet. If an attacker were to shut it down, then any diabetic that tests regularly every two to six hours would notice their blood sugar rising without the uh, insulin provided by the pump. But... If an attacker could induce the pump to deliver a large dose of insulin, whew, that, that, of course, could be fatal. And by the way, the pump's beeps, you would typically not know until it beeped when done delivering the fatal dose of insulin or when your blood sugar had dropped dangerously low. This situation could be life-threatening. Just thought you should have a few more details, and I will be contacting Medtronic to get a better response than, eh, we're not worried about it. <laughs> Well, I'd be worried about it. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to. Somebody would have to be uh, wanting t to get you. But it's just one more. You know, I can see there'll be a movie of the week based on this one. Yeah, exactly. From Hyderabad, India, our second writer from India, Gopi Krishna Reddy Gontuku, wonders how a certificate authority can revoke a certificate that's already been issued. Steve, I love your show. I've been following from episode one. I understood almost everything that you explained about DigiNotar, except for one thing. How can a CA revoke an already issued SSL certificate? Technically, 
The CA signed the cert, which is given to the website owner, right? When an end user connects to the web server, handshaking will occur. And during this process, the end user's browser isn't going to go to the CA website to check if it's revoked. But if that's the case, the browser can check if the cert is valid or not by this call as well. Why not? Why have it? I mean, why would you trust to store it locally if you're not going to check? And what if the CA site has been hacked or the end user's browsers got attacked by DNS spoofing? Am I, am I thinking impractically? Please clarify. That's a good question. It's a great question, and we've touched on it a little bit here and there. We'll be talking in great depth next week about re returning to the whole issue of the, of the PKI, the, the public key infrastructure, where we have defined the roles of certificate authorities and chains of trust and so forth, because there have been some proposals recently for ways of addressing this increasingly creaky foundation which relies on every single certificate authority in the world that our browsers are trusting all being completely perfect in their behavior. And we've seen very recently that's not only difficult, apparently it's impossible. Um, but part of this model has always been the notion of revocation. The need, the recognition was always there that a certificate might need to be revoked. The person whom it was issued to might be breaching their, the agreement under which the authority signed it. They might be misbehaving. They might be conducting themselves poorly. They might have lost control of the certificate themselves so that somebody else has it. And they might say, please revoke the certificate. We were hacked. Somebody may have gotten ours. We'd like another one. But in the meantime, definitely kill off the one we were using before because we don't want anyone being able to masquerade as us. So there's many scenarios where there might be some need for not an entire certificate authority to be untrusted as we have just seen with DigiNotar, but for, for specific certs to be untrusted. Now, we saw this with Komodo where nine certificates were issued fraudulently. And in fact, it is because there, there really isn't a, a really well-functioning solution to this that those, the serial numbers of those certificates are now embedded in the source code of Firefox and Chrome and other browsers. There, there is the two solutions that are part of the, the actual structure, but unfortunately, they don't work reliably enough. One is called a CRL, a certificate revocation list. The idea being that certificate issuers also maintain a site, a, a URL, typically under their domain, where by automation, any browser is able to pick up a list of the certificates they have previously issued, which have not yet expired because remember that's where the expiration of certificates comes in handy every couple of years we need we're, we're, we're we who use them are forced to jump through hoops to renew them but the good news is that keeps these lists of problem certificates from having to grow forever because they only have to revoke those that haven't revoked themselves essentially by virtue of having expired so this CRL is an example and just when I was preparing this question I put in to Google VeriSign space certificate revocation list and if you Google that it'll immediately take you to VeriSign's very nice page where they list all the different types of certificates they issue and the URLs of their CRLs their certificate revocation lists for each type of certificate and in fact, if you, if for example, I was in Firefox, I clicked on one of the links and up popped the dialogue with Firefox saying, oh, I'm adding this CRL to my store. So that, so Firefox was happy to, to add that computer formatted CRL, that certificate revocation list to its, its knowledge of certificates that were revoked, although that was a manual process. One of the fields in certificates is a link to that author to the signing authority's revocation list. So it is possible 
for a browser to be told prior to trusting any connection check for revocation so that if I were to go to somewhere that wanted an, 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 an SSL secured connection the browser could be configured to look at the certificate which the server has provided asserting its trust and in that certificate will be a URL which the browser could immediately then visit in order to see whether by serial number the, ser the certificate it is in the process of considering trusting is as far as this these the certificate authority knows still trustworthy have they declared it revoked or not the problem is that's a slow process that requires additional steps every single time now you can also cache this knowledge so you w would trust for a while which of course does create a window of opportunity where there could be some exploitation that's one of the two approaches the second is something called OCSP which is a, a certificate revocation service and under Firefox if you if you're curious you can look Firefox can be configured to make an OCSP query on a per certificate basis the advantage there is that there's a third party maintaining revocation lists and the the browser makes a query by serial number saying is this serial number revoked and then the OCSP protocol will say no it's not and uh, or th there's even an option that Firefox has for not trusting certificates that aren't affirmatively confirmed that is if the OCSP server that you've configured in your browser doesn't respond normally browsers fail open meaning fail in a trusty direction rather than in a not trusty direction you can change that behavior in Firefox so there are mechanisms complex and messy they slow things down but no one has ever figured out any other way around it because we have this infrastructure right now which where we're we're sort of statically trusting authorities that are in our in our certificate authority store and we're trusting as long as nothing has expired the things that they have asserted um, we should trust and the only the and the problem is since that signing is done things can happen to cause certificates to be revoked the problem is incrementally like verifying every single time we make a connection introduces so much additional overhead browsers don't typically do it the systems are there in place and hyper security conscious people could tell their browsers I really want you to be really secure but it would slow everything down Wow, I think that, that, you know, it's interesting because this is what the Komodo hacker asserted. I have broken SSL. He's no good. Certificate, no good. And, well, uh, he certainly has given us all something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not so good as we thought. Last question. Actually, correction from Jim Schimpf of Derry, PA. I've been listening with interest to your development of the portable sound blaster a.k.a. the dog killer. <laughs> the development board you found is a huge value, the uh, Espresso board, right? Yep, the LPC Espresso. Uh, but for only a little bit of cash, I'll have to look into this for some of my projects, but the Arduino is definitely not in that machine's class. It's a 16 megahertz 8-bit processor. Uh, but I did want to let you know that it is not interpreted code. You do have the full Amtel GCC toolchain on an Arduino, and you are compiling C or C++ code, what makes the Atmel chip an Arduino, in, uh, an Arduino is a boot ROM and a loader. That's why, that's, that's, it's that plus the boot ROM and loader. Uh, you build code that's compiled and linked. If you use the tool chain outside of the Arduino IDE, you can compile and link multiple files, uh, then loaded via the boot loader. Yeah, I wanted to uh, make the correction. Uh, a number of other Arduino users uh, were more knowledgeable about it and said hey Steve you mentioned that it was an interpreted platform um, and they're of course correct um, it I, I chose the the arm cortex m3 because it runs at 120 megahertz and is a 32-bit processor and for example has a 
a single cycle 32 by 32 multiply. So it's an incredibly powerful little chip and amazing that it's $29.95 for the full development platform and all the software. Um, I poked around to understand what it was, how, how I got the impression that Arduino was an interpreted platform. And it's it just that they use the, the, the term sketches. They talk about Arduino sketches as being these essentially the source code and they do have a, a wrapper which which is sort of a, attempts to make the the platform easier to program instead of where in a normal C program you have a main subroutine and main is invoked by the loader as at, at, at runtime and then it's pretty much up to you well it is totally up to you typically what happens in this in this sketch mode with with the Arduino platform you've got two routines a setup and then something called loop and so you put in the setup subroutine anything that you want do, to happen first during initialization at the beginning and then the loop subroutine is just is just continuously called and so you put in there all of the code that you you want to sort of keep alive and have operating and then but within that it's it is just a regular compiled C C++ framework so not with the overhead that I was assuming of interpretation just a much less powerful uh, base hardware platform uh, but also you know certainly there's a lot of support for that as well so I just wanted to make sure everyone had the clarification and the the guys at the LPC espresso site they got 50 in sold them out got 50 in sold them out got 50 in again and they were when I looked this morning about half sold out of that one so I, I'm just tickled that we've got so many listeners that are interested in poking around with hardware because it's just it's a world of fun yeah I think that's uh you've started something there and I think that's kind of cool we're, we want to do a show by the way about kind of about this stuff not a robotics show or a Arduino show but just a maker show where we talk about people doing things like the portable dog killer and and robots and 3D printers and all of that stuff. I think it would really be cool. We want to build a, a space in the back here. And we have a little lab area where we could do that. It would be kind of fun. Cool. Well, Steve, that's it on the uh, 10 questions from our uh, great listeners. Boy, you all are fantastic. We appreciate those questions. Uh, we do this Q&A show every other week. So if you want to get questions in for uh, two weeks hence, all you have to do is go to grc.com slash feedback. And Steve's got a form for you. Much easier for him to handle an email. grc.com slash feedback. GRC, of course, is a spot where you can get 16 kilobit versions of this show, transcriptions, the show notes. Steve's done a great job there. We also offer it at twit.tv, and you can watch live uh, on twit.tv every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Uh, if you're at grc.com, don't forget to check out Spinrite, world's best hard drive maintenance utility. It's a must-have if you've got a hard drive. GRC, that's Steve's site. You can follow Steve on the Twitter. He's also there, at SG. GRC, and uh, he, he's you've been using Twitter a lot. Now we got to move you to Google Plus. Yeah, I, I'm there, but I just haven't really figured out what it is yet. So <laughs> it's just longer. I'm, I'm busy and more I'm, conversation. I'm really, I'm, yes, I'm I'm busy reading David Weber, our newly discovered author. Thank everybody Yay. again for that. Wow, I mean, great, great so, space warfare stuff. I'm space, wondering if I should do, if I should get an audible version of it. Look at the free version. Get it on the Kindle. I can't decide. Uh, that's all there for you, Leo. I guess. I'm, I, I, I mean, you know, you're an audible user. Just try the first book. Yeah. And I tell you, you've got, you're opening an, a, a serious, <laughs> beautiful adventure. And, oh, I should say the, this author does something I was worried about. I mean, I'm just, it's why I really wanted to vet him first before I, I mentioned him, even though <laughs> it was that afternoon that I began reading him after the last podcast. So I didn't really have any opportunity to mention him before now. But it annoys me when authors of a what is clearly a series spends a lot of time in the follow-on books telling us all about right. everything that we already know from the previous books. Right. It's like, yeah, okay, I know. I read that one, and I read the one before. It's, you know, I don't want to take – and this guy, actually, I've been very impressed because I'm sensitive to that. He's He just beautifully sort of in context 
tells you what you only what you need to know. Right. So if you picked it up in the middle, and why would anyone do that when all the books are there? Start at number one. Um, you know, but if you did for some reason, you know, you only want, only book five washed up on the island that you were stranded on, <laughs> then you've you 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 beautifully get only what's necessary. You, uh, sorry, you didn't read one through four. You're you're out of luck on that. Um, but but he he does he does fold in enough just beautifully. So it's not frustrating. It's in context. It's only what you need to know. I, I'm just. I, I'm I'm gonna have to stop reading this on my Kindle. I'm gonna force myself back onto the stair climber so that I'm gonna. <laughs> oh. What a good what a good excuse start. to get some exercise. <laughs> oh God! And I'm I'm a I think I'm about two thirds of the way through Freedom TM, and uh, I'm again I'm only too. allowing myself to read that when I'm working out. So now I have my next series, and oh, it's gonna get me in good shape. Steve, you're the greatest. Thank you for being here. I've got and some reading week, to do. We're so do talk you? About, yep. Next week we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how we come up with alternatives to what we've talked about several times just now in this podcast, the whole certificate authority infrastructure. Oh, okay. How do we solve these problems? Steve's modest proposal. <laughs> no, no, not mine. Other people's. Because oh, okay. everybody knows we got a big problem here. So I'll be doing research on that and present it to our listeners next week, Leo. There's got to be a better way. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time on Security Now. Security Now.